The first type of groups which started to settle in the Western Europe were economic and political immigrants coming from the beginning of the 18th century. They saw it as natural to establish their ethnic churches, despite the fact that their choice of resettlement was more or less free. Home, in a deeper and often idealized sense, remained somewhere else than where they lived. Those groups contributed to what can be called Orthodox diaspora in the West. Even here, though, we need to be aware of the ancient concept of the diaspora, but these concepts need to be transposed for at least two reasons. First, it referred originally to a territory among the barbarians, which is spoken about in the Canon 28 of the Council of Chalcedon. In modern times, the Orthodoxy came to countries with long Christian tradition and brought with themselves different home Orthodox traditions. This takes me to the second point. The notion of diaspora needs to be changed from singular to plural, as there was not only one diaspora and one jurisdiction, that of Constantinople, rather an emerging non-canonical multiplicity of jurisdiction in one territory, something that has caused on the ongoing disagreements within orthodoxy. This anomaly started already with the first arrivals, and then boomed when the hundreds of thousands of political emigrants flew or were deported to the West from Russia after the revolution. The Orthodox in the West, when looking back, more than forward, developed polarized notions of home and the West, as well as strategies for preserving their home cultures and their versions of Orthodoxy as something that should not change. However, this cannot be said about all descendants of those who came with emigration, unless we want to ignore the most valuable contributions which started this seminary, this institute, St. Vladimir Seminary, and many other very important uh, institutions. Uh, today, however, neither in Western Europe nor in Northern America, we can speak only of the local church. The multiplicity of the ethnic churches and their remaining in the status of diaspora, or rather, as I said already, <coughs> diasporas, as they bring with themselves also the non-canonical multiplicity of jurisdiction in one territory, brings the two models of the Orthodox presence in the West into ongoing tension. And it seems that the future of Orthodoxy in the West largely depends on if and so how this tension will be dealt with. Point two, problem of parallel jurisdictions. The non-canonical existence of parallel jurisdictions in the West has been motivated both politically and ethnically. The political impact could be seen in the Greek archdiocese in America, which around the time of its establishment was divided between royalists and venizelists but most of all in the tensions among those who emigrated from Russia, starting with Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia under the recently re-established Serbian Patriarchate, politically right-wing mo right monarchist program, including an oath to restore autocratic Tsarism and the dynasty of Romanovs back in Russia something which was not acceptable for other parts of the Russian emigrants. Metropolitan Yavloji uh, in Western Europe and Plato in the United States, who also wished to protect the Russian Orthodox emigrants from the reach of a church forced into loyalty to the communist regime, had no desire to participate in re-establishing Tsarist autocracy. In their view, Tsarism and Romanovs in particular were at least partly responsible for the social and political collapse of Russia. After complicated negotiations, the Metropolitan, based in Paris, moved under the Patriarchate of Constantinople, and the Metropolitanate in the United States proclaimed independence and struggled for autocephaly, which was reached in 1970. There were also those who felt bound to faithfulness to the Moscow Patriarchate, and while distancing themselves from the pro-communist proclamations of their mother church, had no wish to leave the church in a time of need, and for whom political reasons 
were not a sufficient justification for such a decision. While one can understand why the extreme political situation caused non-standard solutions and pastoral care for the emigrants took precedence over the principle of canonical territoriality, it is also important to ask why the solutions from the time of crisis remained further and why after the fall of communism there is still more jurisdictional fragmentation than before. Besides the political reasons for the parallel jurisdictions, there are also ethnic reasons. According to the Archimind right, Gregorius Papathomas, where are you, Gregorius? <laughs> Ethnophilatism is the greatest heresy of modern times. Breaking the church communion, divinizing concerns that are not the ultimate ones, I agree, is highly, highly problematic. However, it seems to me that when looking at the ethnically motivated jurisdictional anomalies, instead of the more common criticism of the modern understanding of the nation that served as a secular replacement of the bond of unity given by the church belonging, it may be helpful to look at the pre-modern sources of the problem as well. And it seems that the memories of denied equality trampling down of the local Christian tradition, language, and culture are still alive and often unhealed. The narratives of injustice play a vital role when different people talk about the Byzantine heritage or about the problem of role, oh, sorry, I got lost, of ethnophilatism. The meaning passed on through the same phrases is not the same as it depends on who is speaking, just as our remembering and narrating the past is never free of our power interests. These are usually more present when memories of deprivation are involved as well. Sensitive work with the memories of belonging and memories of deprivation can, in my view, play an important role in healing the broken unity. There are examples in the past that can provide models of life that were not given place in the later stages. Uh, we can rightly criticize ethnos uh, being taken for the ultimate value. We need to recognize that the Orthodox Church, uh, whether in the traditional Orthodox lands or in the West, will not move beyond ethnocentric discourse until, as Pantelis Kalaitsidis says, it abandons any illusion of returning to Byzantine theocracy or any other romantic, anti-modern idea of Christian society, like Holy Russia or the sacralized Balkan monarchies. It seems that while there is no easy solution to the problem of the politically and ethnically motivated jurisdictional multiplicity, there is a lot of work that can be done at the pastoral level. And through the new light, through that new light may fall on the theological and canonical debate. Point three, ways beyond the theological and spiritual uniformity. In this final part, I want to talk about the paradox that lies in the fact that while looking at the canonical situation of orthodoxy in the West, there seems to be plurality without unity. While looking at the theological landscape, with some exceptions, there seems to be uniformity without plurality. Of course, this is a great simplification. However, in this simplification, there might be some elements worth engaging with. And I will concentrate on the separation of the neopatristic school from other forms of renewal which used to be integrally connected to it. In the West, a conflict arose between what Father Florovsky called the Russian religious renaissance, which he characterized as a pseudomorphosis of tradition, and the neopatristic school. Plurality was replaced largely by a synthesis. So the movements uh, like uh, Hesychasm, uh, Slavophile movements, sociology, uh, Christian attempts to find social reforms in the country, uh, they disappeared and the dialogical space went with them. 
Within, with notable exceptions such as Vladimir Losky or Father Dumitru Stanhoye, the neopatristic synthesis became the new via affirmativa, or we could even say, I will slightly provokingly, a new scholasticism in an orthodox key, promising a distinct orthodox identity in polemics with the West and with modernity. The current generation of orthodox theologians, such as Father John Baer, Aristotle Papanikolaou, or Pantelis Kalaitidis, have provided detailed and sharp criticism of such identity building. What still needs to be done, in my view, is the recovery of the lost plurality. The neopatristic turn brought many good things. First of all, the actual detail studying of the church fathers gave antidotes to uniformity. And again, in the printed paper, you have many other phrases. And I really like the neopatristic neo school. In fact, it really brought me closer to orthodoxy. However, I think it's important to revive the voices which were temporarily marginalized. As a cousin, Despite the fact that it was studied at the Western seminaries theologically and that Father Florovsky or Father Meindorf contributed most valuable studies, which were greatly used up till now, during the first two generations of post-revolution emigrants, it was not with exceptions accompanied by a Hesychast spiritual practice. In fact, liturgical spirituality pushed away Hesychast spirituality. This is something which at least starts to change, as the people who uh, live in the monasteries in the Western Europe and uh, in the United States cease to be considered uh, as uh, one of the older generation people at St. Vladimir Seminary told me, the new cowboys coming to the West, but are beginning to be taken seriously. The Slavophile movement did not die out with the ideology of pan-Slavism, although I have no desire to defend this ideology. Uh, coming from Czech Republic and having this great neighbor in the East, I think you would believe me there. Komyakov's notion of Sobornost partly found its new expressions through Father Afanasiev's Eucharistic Ecclesiology and then Father Schmemann's Liturgical Ecclesiology. Nevertheless, in my view, Komyakov's mystical anthropology and ecclesiology combining mutual love and freedom, as well as Kiryevsky's notion of integral knowledge, bringing together the scientific approaches with the reasons of heart, still await to be more deeply valued. The Christian foundations of social reform, especially after the experience with the communist regime, felt like utopia. And yet in Berdyaye, Father Bulgakov or Mother Maria Skopcova, the threat re-emerged, whether in the philosophy of freedom or in the reflection of the particular help to the needed. Sophiology was marked as heretical due to the process with Father Bulgakov, and yet it cannot be reduced to the problematic teaching on the four hypostasis. In connection to the Slavophile roots, it has been rediscovered as a way of holistic growth towards pan-unity, challenging the exclusion of embodied knowledge, of mystical knowledge, as well as the separation of the Christian East from the Christian West, or Christianity from other forms of finding goodness, beauty, and truth. As such, it was more often adopted by the Roman Catholics than the Orthodox theologians. But even there we find exceptions, such as Antoine Arzakovsky or Stoyan Tanev. These are just some examples of the plurality that has been lost, though in no way exclusive of, of still other possible ways of spiritual and theological life, which may be also genuinely orthodox. The recovery of the lost plurality is not a way to lose the sources, from which Christian and Orthodox life flows, and it is not giving up on the need for discernment. Rather, it is a plea that the discernment would not be done on the ideological grounds. Coming to the conclusion, first, I would like to say that uh, Orthodoxy 
that has already rooted in the West is in the process that this routine is not finished and it needs to continue in the creative manner and in a manner that is pastorally sensitive <coughs> towards uh, including organically all those who belong here and especially all those who were marginalized in the past or wounded. As was already said, it is inappropriate to speak about the well-established bodies, whether ecclesial or intellectual, in terms of diaspora. And again, I think it needs to be looked at more in terms of the local church. And here, the divisions caused by the jurisdictional anomaly, but also by the preferences, uh, whether political or ethnical, which place what is not ultimate as the ultimate. This is something which needs to be looked at. And finally, when speaking about the danger of spiritual and theological uniformity, I think being aware of that danger is already a step out of that. And uh, I think that the future of Orthodox diaspora would also largely depend on how it manages to embrace its treasures, which were multiple, not single, and how it manages to work with them and to face the challenges that lies in the future. Thank you very much for your attention.